Eleanor was born, most likely in 1122, as the oldest child and eventual heir to her father, William X, the Duke of Aquitaine. Eleanor grew up beautiful, outgoing and intelligent. She received a comprehensive education in arts and sciences, as well as languages and physical activities. With the promise of her inheritance, the powerful Duchy of Aquitaine in the south of modern France, she was easily one of the most sought-after brides in all of 12th century Europe. Eleanor herself, of course, had no say in these matters. The lands were to be hers only nominally and would be transferred to her husband upon marriage. As the final act before his death, her father arranged for the King of France, Louis VI, to become the guardian for the 15-year-old heiress Eleanor. The king thanked him for the honor and promptly married her off to his own son, the future King Louis VII. Before the year was over, Louis ascended to the throne, making Eleanor the Queen of France. King Louis himself seems to have been infatuated with his new bride, but the sentiment was not universally shared in his kingdom. The reserved northern culture of the capital city in Paris was a long way away from the provincial south. The young queen was thought flighty, immodest and wholly improper. And furthermore, critics were quick to blame her for the bloody conflicts the king soon ran into, first with one of his vassals, the Count of Champagne, and later with the Pope. After years of conflict in penance for his insolence against the Church, Louis agreed to join the Second Crusade to the Holy Land, and the Queen Consort demanded to go with him. In 1147, 25-year-old Eleanor left her then two-year-old daughter behind to lead the soldiers of her duchy east. Their campaign was a failure from beginning to the end. The army did manage to make their way to Eleanor's uncle Raymond, prince of the crusader state of Antioch, but failed to retake the city of Edessa, which had been the main objective of the crusade. The relations between Louis and Eleanor had already become strained before the campaign, but the added stress of the journey brought the situation to its breaking point. Louis had no interest in Edessa. Instead, he had his sights set out on completing his pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Eleanor sided with her uncle, the main proponent of the campaign to take back the city, and soon rumors about infidelity and an incestuous affair between the queen and her uncle, 23 years her senior, were abound. Louis forced Eleanor, against her will, to abandon her uncle's court in the dead of the night and to join him in his travel south. The couple's relationship never recovered. Without achieving any military victories, the royal couple embarked on separate ships to return back to Europe. After the months-long arduous travel back home, Eleanor learned that her uncle Raymond had been killed in battle. Eleanor appealed to the Pope to have her marriage annulled, but she was rebuked until the birth of her second daughter. Failing to produce a male heir, the marriage of Eleanor and Louis was annulled on grounds of consanguinity. Eleanor was Louis's third cousin once removed. Louis was granted the guardianship of their two daughters as they stood to inherit the French throne. Eleanor's lands were restored back to her. Now aged 30, the newly unattached Duchess of Aquitaine, with all her lands to her name, was once again a desirable target for kidnapping and forced marriage. Eleanor, however, had already made arrangements with the 19-year-old Henry of the House Plantagenet, the Duke of Normandy and Louis's rival. Eight weeks after the annulment of her marriage, Eleanor was remarried. The new union created a realm bigger than that of the King of the French. An enraged Louis quickly organized a coalition of Henry's enemies in France as well as in England, where he had a claim to the throne through his mother, the Empress Matilda. Through decisive military victories, Henry squashed the coalition and secured his hold first in France and eventually in England, creating the mighty Angevin Empire. Eleanor was crowned the Queen of England, 
alongside her husband Henry II in 1154. We can only speculate what Eleanor would have hoped to achieve with her second marriage to the teenage Norman Duke. She had to form an alliance with someone as attempts at her freedom had begun the moment she left the safety of Louis's court. It is widely assumed that the two had had some contact and that negotiations were being held while she was still married to her first husband. Eleanor was negotiating from a disadvantage due to her gender. She had to remarry or someone would marry her. With Louis, she had through her charm and the power of her personality been able to have some effect on his decisions and attitudes up until the fateful dispute in Antioch. Perhaps she thought the young Henry would be similarly moldable. Henry II, however, had very much a mind of his own, and in the long run the royal couple would be pushed to open conflict with tragic results. In some ways the couple had chemistry. Both were active, ambitious and dynamic. Eleanor would accompany her husband in his travels around the kingdom as the new king went to work to repair the devastation caused by a civil war that had preceded him. More often than not, Eleanor would be pregnant. The couple welcomed eight children in the first 14 years of their marriage. In addition to the two daughters, Marie and Alice, she had with her first husband, Eleanor birthed five sons and three daughters for Henry. They were William, Henry, Matilda, Richard, Geoffrey, Eleanor, Joanna and John. Eleanor's children and grandchildren would go on to marry into royal houses of the time, including that of her first husband, Louis VII, and to become the kings and queens of Europe. Still, both Henry and Eleanor had strong-willed, even domineering personalities. Henry was dictatorial in his rule towards his barons and subjects, as well as his wife and progeny. He did not share in his power. Even in Eleanor's very own dear Aquitaine, the English king imposed his rule over the duchess herself. He did not seek his wife's counsel, preferring the company of his favorite, the Archbishop Thomas Becket. Effectively, Eleanor was demoted to the role of a mere consort and the mother of his legitimate children. After the birth of their youngest, John, in 1166, the couple became terminally estranged. Henry had always had his philandering ways, but with famed beauty Rosamond Clifford, the king didn't even try to be discreet. After marrying her 11-year-old daughter off to a Saxon duke, Eleanor packed her bags and returned home to Poitiers. Eleanor had grown up in a household and a region known for its vibrant culture and way of life. Aquitaine was the birthplace of the Occitan language and the vernacular lyric poetry of troubadours. In fact, the first troubadour known to history by name was Eleanor's grandfather, William IX of Aquitaine. Part of the troubadour's cult of platonic love was the high-minded adoration of unattainable, noble women by their pitiful, love-starved, would-be suitors, all translated into emotive verse. In many ways, Eleanor was the perfect exemplar for the revered female sure of her abilities and expectance of devotion. Eleanor's consequent five-year stay at Poitiers is the stuff of legends. The era is called the court of love as it encouraged a culture of chivalry, high art and romanticized love in her court, establishing foundations for what would eventually become the celebrated manners and value system of French knights and nobility. Eleanor's court welcomed the artists, poets and troubadours of the day, leaving a lasting influence in the culture and folklore of the region. But not very much is actually known of these years. Most of the legend of Eleanor's courts of love seems to stem from a Tractatus de Amore, a treatise about love authored in the 1180s 
possibly by the commission of Eleanor's daughter Marie, Countess of Champagne. Like its name suggests, the treatise deals with the themes of love as it pertains to court, to marriage and to passion. It describes how Eleanor and her entourage would hold court and pass judgment on different aspects of love, effectively codifying the specter of its different types, its effects and the proper etiquette in the matters of the heart. Most likely this depiction of a system whereof women's feminine virtues would be lifted up for idolization and high-minded contest was more fantastical wishful thinking than a true reflection of those turbulent years of constant warfare and disturbances by rebel-rousing bands of bored young men. But it is a reflection of a new cultural tendency breaking with medieval misogyny and with the emerging cult of the Virgin Mary, an opening towards new ideals and what would later be known as courtly love. Whatever the nature of Eleanor's court in Poitiers, this era came to a swift end when Eleanor was once again called to participate in the harsh power politics of Europe. By then, the realm of Henry II had been divided between three of his sons, and the oldest of them, named Henry as well, had been crowned king alongside his father in 1170. However, the old king was unwilling to relinquish any of his power or additional funds to his upstart arrogant would-be successor. So, in 1173, the young King Henry had grown restless enough to launch a revolt against his father. He was only 18 at the time, and his younger brothers Richard and Geoffrey, who joined him in his rebellion, were only 16 and 15 respectively. Therefore, the blame for the son's revolt was largely laid on Eleanor as an image of a power-hungry harpy of a mother. The alliance of Henry's enemies that was quick to assemble in support of the young king made it clear that the rebellion was not just a spur-of-the-moment decision, but had been pre-planned at least to an extent. The actions of his son seemed to have caught the old king completely by surprise, while the 51-year-old queen was quick to rise to the occasion and did her best to muster support in the south. However, she was caught and imprisoned by her husband as soon as she left Poitiers. For the next 16 years, Eleanor would be shuffled as a prisoner from one castle and fortress to the next, while her sons went to battle against their father over and over again, unsuccessfully. Eleanor was finally released from captivity only after Henry died in 1189. By then, the young King Henry had already passed away. The one to succeed the old king to the throne was the third son, Richard, later known as the Lionheart. Richard was Eleanor's pride and joy, her favorite. Even from a young age, he was the picture of the idolized handsome warrior poet, bold, dashing and chivalrous in manners cruel and ruthless on the battlefield. Born in England but raised as the future Duke of Aquitaine by his mother in Poitiers, Richard was the least English of the English kings. He had no interest in governing England and ended up spending most of his reign elsewhere. For Eleanor, the decade of Richard's rule was the pinnacle of her power and her revenge on the men who had tried to keep her from it. Richard was nothing if not deferential to the opinions of his venerated mother, at least on matters of diplomacy. Although not named an official regent, Eleanor was the absolute guarantor of the king's interest in his absence as the Queen of England. When Richard was captured upon his return from the Third Crusade and held hostage by his rivals, it was Eleanor who campaigned to keep the realm united against his enemies back home, as well as to collect and deliver the heavy ransom demanded for his release. But the stress and the constant traveling across the lands was starting to take a toll on the Queen Mother now in her 70s. With her beloved son released from captivity and back at the helm of the empire, Eleanor took her retreat to the Fontevraud Abbey in 1194. 
The Abbey had always been a place of special care for Eleanor. Founded in the year 1011, the Abbey had become a safe haven especially for ill-treated and off-caste noble women, like her paternal grandmother. In the Abbey, women were instated into positions of power and leadership, creating an atmosphere of solace and sisterly comfort for the hardships these typically powerless and vilified women had had to endure in their lives. Eleanor had been a benefactor for the Abbey since her 20s, and now made it her place of residence after Richard's return. Not an ordained nun, but a guest of the Abbey, Eleanor could set up a comfortable living situation with an all-female court of sorts, close enough to her son to keep abreast of the situation of the realm, but protected from the scrutiny of court. Eleanor probably hoped to pass her final years in peace, leaving the fate of the House Plantagenet and the Angevin Empire to the hands of her magnificent Richard. Alas, it was not meant to be. Eleanor outlived her son the Lionheart, and 1199, age 77, saw her youngest son, John, become the third Angevin king. John had never been a favorite for succession for either Eleanor or Richard, but when push came to shove, Eleanor threw herself into making sure John remained secure on the throne. She left the comfort of Fontevraud, and once again took it upon herself to travel the lands, creating alliances and rallying allies. By now Eleanor was held in considerable reverence as the Grand Old Dame of the House Plantagenet. She was the symbol of continuity and a guarantor for competence during the turbulent times. For three months the Queen Mother toured the Empire, laying the whole weight of her personal influence and political savvy to successfully claim, cajole and buy over the nobles of the realm for John's benefit. After their triumph of arranging the marriage of John's niece to the future heir to the French throne, and after successfully preventing her grandson Arthur, arrival to the throne of John's, from taking Poitiers, the exhausted Eleanor retreated back to Fontevraud. Despite all of Eleanor's efforts, it soon became apparent that John was a poor substitute for the shield willpower of his father Henry or the military prowess of Richard. The new king went on to make a plunder after another, slighting allies and aggravating enemies alike. At this point, Eleanor was too frail and in ill health to intervene on her son's behalf. By the time Eleanor then died in 1204, French King Philip II, the main rival to the house Plantagenet and the son of her first husband Louis, had already started his campaign to take over many of the Plantagenet possessions south of the English Channel. Ten years after the death of his mother, John was defeated in battle and withdrew from France, effectively bringing an end to the Angevin Empire. <laughs>